morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody out here this morning. If you're a visitor with us this morning, you're especially welcome. And I know we definitely have two. So we have Rick from the Netherlands. Where's Rick from the Netherlands? Rick is over in Sydney. And we have Alistair Groves. Where's Alistair? He's down there as well. Down in Sydney. Well. Rick. I'm going to be doing a wee interview with Rick later on in the service. Uh, so we look forward to chatting to you then. We're not really sure what we're saying yet, Rick. Sure we're not, but we'll, we'll, we'll do the interview at that stage. We'll figure it out as we go. And as we, as we come today, we want to extend our prayers to the family of Bill Maben, whose funeral took place on Thursday past. And we're thinking especially of Edith, Ross, Claire, Jack, Harry, and Ren, and the wider family circle. Our evening service is at 6 p.m. and that is a service of Holy Communion and we would invite you to, to come back at 6 o'clock and if you love the Lord and are living a right relationship with him, we would invite you to, to partake in, in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Little Gems is on tomorrow at 10 a.m. Our baby and anger boys is back tomorrow. On Wednesday, we have prayers for those who are ill at 11, and our midweek Bible study and prayer time is on at 8 p.m. The Boating Club is on Thursday at 7.30, and next Sunday, our Sunday School and Bible class is at 10, prayer meetings at 11, and our morning service, a remembrance service, is on at half 11 with snatch at 6 o'clock. Uh, with YF at 7.15. And I've been asked to do a special plug. And this special plug is for the 16th of November. Now, on the 16th of November, please try to keep that day free. And come at 10 a.m. and eat the whole day. <laughs> Just eat the entire day. You can start off with a breakfast bath at 10 and keep eating them with scones and tray bakes. Keep eating all of that until 5. <laughs> and once you get to 5, order a fry. <laughs> and maybe a Christmas kebab after the fry. <laughs> and all proceeds is going towards the church renovation project. I'm sort of sitting laughing, standing laughing to myself because I don't eat any of them things. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, a sentence of, but I will be there. A sentence of scripture from 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And that patience we read of in 2 Peter is God demonstrating his grace to us. We don't deserve his patience. We don't deserve his grace. And in verse 1 of our first song, we sing, God of grace, I stand in wonder as my God restores my soul. His own blood has paid my ransom, awesome cost to make me whole. <coughs> And as we start our service today, I want to ask you this question. Have you taken that step to put your trust in Jesus? And let us stand to sing God of Grace. <laughs>
also before not working in my life because I had to learn not to look at myself but to trust fully on uh, oh my God, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And why I'm here? Uh, that's because of the, of the CMLC. Um, yeah, uh, my fiance has done the CMLC in the, in the Germany, and I also uh, uh, love to work with children. Uh, so that's the reason why I, uh, I'm here to, to learn more about it. And it's been a real blessing for, for this. Uh, and you've been here five weeks now, isn't that right? I've been here for uh, seven weeks. Seven weeks? Seven weeks. And yeah. in Seaview? Uh, six weeks in Seaview and one week with uh, Dixon Adam in uh, Red Weeks. Rick, it's lovely to see you. Let, let's just pray for Rick and Alistair here, that, that's here this morning, just before we, we continue. Father, we thank you, Lord, for everyone who has put their faith in your son the lord jesus and father we pray lord for rick and we pray for alistair lord and father we we pray and we thank you lord for people who want to really take the time to put their life in your hands lord and to work full time in, in ministry with children lord and father we thank you we thank you for them and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lovely to see you. And now we, we come to our confession. And if we think back through the week, I'm sure there's things that we have said, things that we have done. Things that we have thought that is, is sinful and disrespects God's law, God's word. So let us confess our sins firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace by saying the words together on the screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may walk in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And the assurance of forgiveness we can find in John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let us together say the Lord's Prayer. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let us stand together as we sing our second song, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God.
taken from Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is God's word. <coughs> close to home? Is it a job that I have to go far away for? Maybe. What other thing would you think about? There's one thing people would think about. Go on, baby, tell us. Money. 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 How much money you're going to make doing the job? Well, in our passage today, we meet somebody who has chosen a job all about getting money. All about making loads and loads of money. And it's a man called Levi, and his job is a tax collector. Now, what is a tax collector? Well, a tax collector is somebody who comes and takes money out of your wages that you get paid for doing a job. So, we're going to imagine, Ruben, you are a footballer, okay? And you've been playing football all day, and you've got paid five pieces of silver. So, there's your payment, right? And I'm going to be the tax collector. And I'm going to come and say, okay, you've got paid five. I need three of those back. I need three of those back because I need to give those to the Romans. That was what his job was. And you know, this man wasn't very liked. Do you like the fact that I did that to you? No, you do not. Look at your face. You don't like it at all. And do you know what was even worse about it? Do you know what was even worse? I didn't even give all of this to the Romans. I maybe gave this one to the Romans. And do you know why I did those two? Do you know what the tax collector did? Put it in his own pocket. He was a cheat. And so the people hated him. They thought that he was a traitor because he was giving money to the Romans. And they thought that he was really dishonest because he was keeping some of it for himself as well. So this man, do you think he would have wanted to be his friend? <coughs> Definitely not. He wasn't a very nice man at all. In fact, um, those people at that time wouldn't even have been allowed into the synagogues and they were a disgrace to their family. People really didn't like them. But what's really incredible about what happened in our passage today is that even though Jesus knew how wicked and unkind this man was, Jesus still loved him. And he gave him an invitation to come and follow him. And so this man, Levi, he responds to the invitation and he leaves behind all of that business of taking money and he goes and follows Jesus. And then Jesus goes and has dinner at Levi's house. Now we kind of miss how incredible that was. 
Back then, if you went to, for dinner at someone's house, it was a big deal. Okay? You were showing that you were friends with them. You were showing that you were in relationship with them. It was really symbolic if you went to go and have dinner. And so the religious leaders, they heard that Jesus was having dinner with Levi and with Levi's friends. And they were not one bit happy. They were furious. You see, the religious leaders, they thought that they were better than everybody else. And so they separated themselves from anybody they thought that was unholy. So they wouldn't have gone anywhere near this man, Levi, or his friends. And so they asked Jesus, or they asked about Jesus, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus' response is really interesting. Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So they've asked, why is Jesus eating with a man like this? And Jesus' answer is simple. He says he's like a doctor, and he has come to heal those people who are sick with sin. He has come to this earth to save people who are sinners like Levi. And you know, sometimes we can maybe fall into the same trap that those Pharisees fell into. You know, maybe we could think, you know, that Levi's really terrible. I'm glad I'm not like him. Maybe you're in school and you're thinking, oh, I'm so glad I'm not bad like this person. You know, I don't be cheeky. I don't say bad words. I don't hit other people. I don't cheat in my tests. You maybe can think, you know, I'm not like Levi. But actually, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, none of us are any better than Levi or anybody else. The Bible tells us not one of us is good, not even one, because every single one of us is sick with sin. Jesus talked about that sickness, and that sickness is on the inside. It's the sickness that we're all born with. Every single one of us, just like Levi, has thought things, said things, and did things that break God's laws. And the sickness of our sin on the inside has consequences. If you think back a few years ago to COVID time, Catching COVID had consequences, didn't it? You had, you'd be sneezing, you'd be coughing, some of us really weirdly lost our taste and smell. You'd have to isolate yourself from other people. But you know, the consequences of sin are far more serious. The consequence of our sin, sickness, our sickness on the inside, is that our relationship with God has been destroyed. We can't have a friendship with God because God is holy, he is perfect, and he has to punish sin. And you know, if we die without having our sin sickness dealt with, we're not going to be with God. It's not going to happen. But you know, just like God loved Levi, God loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. And that's why he sent Jesus. Jesus came because he's the only one that can deal with our sin sickness. He was the only one that didn't have this sickness and yet he went to the cross and he died having lived a perfect life for you and for me so that we could be forgiven. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again three days later and now he's in heaven and he offers you and me the cure for our sin. And what is that cure? Well, it's to turn from your sin and trust in him for forgiveness. But you know, Jesus' cure is a bit like a bottle of medicine. Imagine I had here in my hand a bottle of medicine. I'm standing here telling you I have a cure. What do you have to do with the medicine for it to work? What do you have to do? You have to take it. Jesus is giving you this offer, completely free gift, to be forgiven, to be cleansed of your sin. But you have to take it. You have to come to him, tell him you're sorry for your sin, and put your trust in him. So you've all heard here this morning what the cure is. You've heard that you have a choice to make. So I wonder, will you accept it? Will you become part of God's family. And I know some of you here already have. That's fantastic. What our job is then is to go and to tell other people about Jesus, to tell them about this cure, to tell them about this one that can forgive them. So I'm just going to pray and then we'll hand back to David. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for your word to us, Lord. We thank you that it teaches us all about you and your love for us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that even though each one of us is sick with this problem of sin, Lord, that you sent your Son into this world to be our Saviour. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to go to the cross for us, to die in our place so that we can be forgiven. 
Father, I do just pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who has not accepted that cure from you, has not accepted you as their saviour, Lord, that they would really consider that, Lord. Consider the importance of that, Father, and that they would take that step. And Lord, for those of us who have made that choice, Father, I really do just pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to go and to share with other people the good news about you. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> stand together now and sing our children's song and at the end of this song the boys and girls can head out to children's church we're going to stand together to sing god is so good Sick, don't bother the NHS. 
Why does Jesus say these words? Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. Are you and I sick? Do we need the doctor? Jesus is walking around Lake Galilee, and he's teaching a large crowd, and he passes a tax collector, Levi, or in other Bibles we know him as Matthew. Now, what you and I need to know is what Emma was teaching us in the children's talk as well, that Levi was getting rich through dodgy business practices. None of us, I'd say, put up your hand if you like paying taxes, and all of us would go. And this is not HMRC. This is really dodgy work. This is like Emma said, you know, you get five coins, he takes away three, pockets two, and gives the Roman government one. And everybody knows what's going on. And so these guys are absolutely detested. And it's to <coughs> him that Jesus says, verse 14, follow me. Follow me. And, and, and just like the four disciples we saw in chapter 1, Jesus calls people with authority and they come. They follow. And we see Jesus and Levi they end up in Levi's house having dinner together. And it's not just the two of them. Look at verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. So here we are. Jesus and the disciples and many others who are following King Jesus. And it's a party. It's in full swing. Everybody's having a great time, apart from guys like me, you know, the ones with the plastic hoops around their necks, the religious. Verse 16, when the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They say, don't they, that you can tell a lot about a person about the, with the company they keep. And Jesus is reclining with those who rip you off, who give your money to the enemies, and with sinners. These are people on the fringe, rejected by their society. And it's those people Jesus is eating with. Those people who would make you and I feel very, very uncomfortable, uncomfortable. Now, I don't know which part of the Netherlands, Rick, or Ralph Ryland, Alistair, or Newry, or Newcastle, or Kilkeel, or even Anlong. I haven't worked out where the dodgy places are. But you know. And you know the type of people that live there, and the type of things that they do. Now imagine the king left Buckingham Palace and he's headed in that direction. Now this is not a formal visit or to open a charity or a school. He's heading there to let his hair down. He's going to eat with them and drink with them. He's going to hang out with the locals and enjoy their company. I imagine you saw that happening. What would you make of it? Put it at the end. Why is he doing that? Well, the Pharisees, they can't believe their eyes. They can't believe what Jesus is doing. This man claiming to bring in the kingdom of God, hanging out with people like this, it's a scandal. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's not a question, is it? It's an accusation, a statement of, you can't trust him. Why, Jesus, you shouldn't be here. If you were actually God's son, if you were bringing in the kingdom of God, if you were who you claimed to be, you'd know these type of people and you wouldn't be with them. And how does Jesus respond? What do you think he would say? Well, he could have said, sorry, lads. I didn't know who they were. I'm really sorry. I'll not do it again. He could have said, well, the only reason I was eating with them was to show them the errors of their way. You didn't see me 
But just after you left, I opened up the Torah, the Jewish law, and I started telling them how sinful they were. He actually says something more shocking than that. Do you see what he says to the religious types? He says the thing about the doctor, but he's building up the punchline. And those religious leaders are meant to see that the punchline was squarely aimed at them. Verse 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So this little scene with the tax collectors and sinners and the religious leaders is all about for whom did Jesus come? And we find the answers to that question first negatively and then positively. Negatively, it's this. Jesus didn't come for those who think they don't need him. Let me ask you, what type of person are you? And when I ask that sort of question, it makes people feel uncomfortable. Even as I asked that, it felt like the air being sucked out of the room. You know, all of a sudden we're all, ha, 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 ha. And then he asked this question, we're like, don't look at him. Don't catch his eye. You probably answer, well, well I, I'm basically good. I, I try to do my best. I don't hurt anybody. Don't get me wrong, I don't be, claim to be perfect, but there again, who is? But I do try to do what is right, and I aim to be the best I can be, so I'm basically okay. What do you think Jesus would make of that attitude? Well, I can tell you, it's there at the end of verse 17. Please look at it. Jesus says to you and me, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus is doing a, a huge wedge into all humanity. He is dividing humanity into two groups. See, most people think that that two groups are the good people over on the righteous side and the bad people, the people who don't come up to the mark, they're sinners. You know, I'm only here about seven weeks, but I have already had too many funerals. And I take many, many funerals. And what is it that every family wants to hear from this lector about their deceased? That they're good. All right, is that how we'd like to be thought of? We're good? And I'm not going to be the judge of that. But if that was the issue, how would you and I fare? Which group would you and I be in? We often hear the phrase that Jesus is for everybody. But the shock of verse 17 is, no. That's what Jesus says here. Look at it. Look at it again. He says, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. See, if, if you think that Jesus came to hand out stars on a chart star, a star chart, chart star, don't mean what I'm saying, a, a, a star chart for being good, you got it wrong. If in the end we think we're okay without Jesus, well then Jesus can do nothing for you. And I don't know about you, but that is unsettling. It's shocking. You know, we're only in chapter 2, not even finished chapter 2, we're only halfway through it. And we've seen through chapter 1 how amazing Jesus is. He, he, he's taught with such authority. He's brought in that message of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. We've seen him heal diseases and paralysis. We've seen him forgive sins. It's all amazing stuff. We probably, if we lived around the Lake Galilee in the first century, want to hang about with Jesus. And surely we think he'd be for us. So let me ask you a really serious question this morning. Do you, do I, want to exclude ourselves from Jesus? My guess is by you coming to church, your answer is no. But look again, what does Jesus mean by the word righteous? Why does he have nothing for them? 
Well, as we go through Mark's gospel, we will see that Mark and Jesus will reveal our hearts, and it's not a pretty sight. In, in case we miss it, by the time we got, get to chapter 10, Jesus says, none of us are righteous. Not me, not you, not anybody. So in that sense, no one is righteous. But here in chapter 2, Jesus is warning those like the religious leaders who think they are religious. If we think we are righteous without Jesus, he has got nothing for us. And I guess if you're a born again Christian, you get this. You know you're not righteous. That's why we say that confession every week. But our hearts are so deceitful. Saying confession is one thing, but do we believe what we say? Do we believe we're not okay? That we're not good people? That we're not basically all right? Because what happened that day by Lake Galilee gives us a warning of the telltale signs to watch out for. These teachers of all, these Pharisees, look down their noses at others, and it's so easy to do. That attitude is everywhere around us. You just have to sit in a coffee shop for about five minutes and you'll hear something along the lines like, oh, so-and-so was doing this or so-and-so was doing that with the implication that they wouldn't do it, that they're far better, morally more superior than anybody else. But are we just the same in practice? Do we look down on the immigrants, at the poor, the drug addicts, the person with the addictions, the, the young single mothers? Do we look down at the people who don't go to church? Is there a, a kind of sense of us as we go past them, as we drive out to church, that we look at their curtains closed, closed and we think that we're better than them just because we go to church? Well, I'm sure none of us would be so crass to say we're righteous, but I'm sure we do play that game. We talked about it last week. You know that game where we say, I'm not as good as but I'm better than them. You know, we all do it. Going back to Jesus' medical example, are we, in the end, telling the doctor, it's the rest waiting in, the, in that room back there that needs you and I don't need you? Well then, who did Jesus come for? Jesus came for those who knew they needed him. I don't know what's going on in your heart this morning. And you don't know what's going on in mine. And I'm so glad you're here. But there could be a hundred different reasons why you're here. And as I talk about sin and righteousness, it may be that the Holy Spirit comes upon you in deep conviction and you, you're thinking to yourself, wow, God could come anywhere near me. You think that the way you and I have lived is if God isn't there. The way that you and I have treated people. Maybe you think, I've managed to fool others over the years, but I can't fool God. There's nothing I can do about it. Surely Jesus wouldn't want to touch me with a 20-foot barge pole. Well, again, come back to the end of verse 17. Read it really slowly. I have not come to call the righteous. sinners. Those are amazing words for those who think they deserve nothing from Jesus. And the truth is, they're exactly right. We deserve nothing from Jesus. We deserve hell. That's what we deserve. But Jesus comes to us in our brokenness and our sin. Think again of Jesus' medical scenario. Think of the doctor's surgery and someone has seen the warning signs. They head to the specialist doctor, but with a resigned expression on their face, the doctor says, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. That's often how sinners feel coming to Jesus. Faced with their sin. You know, it, it, sometimes the Bible sort of pushes that false message, or at least you can read it falsely, you can think that God doesn't want to have anything to do with you if you're a sinner. You read lines like in Psalm 5 verse 4, 
For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. And you think, how can a holy God deal with me as a sinful human being? Surely God would just push me off the face of this earth. But look again at verse 17. I've not come to call the righteous, but thank God. Thank you, Lord. You've come to call people like me a sinner. Jesus knows that none of us are good. But it's to those who realize that we're not good, that we can't save ourselves, that Jesus says, come, I've done it all. Come and receive. And when you and I realize what we're truly like, when we despair of ourselves, when we think there is no hope, when we think we've come to the end of the road, Jesus says, no, oh, yeah, I'm here. There is one who can and will address the problem of sin. We saw that as he healed the paralytic. He has authority to forgive sins. See, as we've seen, and hopefully we're getting the picture now as we go through Mark's Gospel week by week, we are all sin sick. But by sinners, what Jesus means is those who have got it. They understand the diagnosis. And they're not pretending that they're not sin sick. See, as a church, we are more like a hospital. We're not better than anybody else out there. We're not here because we're special. We're sin sick. But we've realized there's a doctor who can heal us. As a Christian, we've seen the cure. And actually, we've seen who the cure is. We want to tell others about Jesus, the only one who can deal with the problem of sin. Great news, world. Jesus has come for people like you and I who are messed up, who are sinful. He can save us. So as we close, let me ask a question. Do you need the doctor? I, I, I mean, not just for the man flu. Not like, you know... <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean this seriously. Do you realize how sin sick you are? Do you get it? Do you realize you need it urgently? And to the extent that we don't really believe, or we think that this is just Brian Martin making it up, let's ask the Lord to reveal to us the sin that is in your heart and mind. See, the, the, the way we need help is not the, oh, I'll just muddle through. It, it, the extent of the help is 999, get the blue lights. It, it, it is an emergency. We need it sorted today. Look again who Jesus came for. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy you need a doctor. those who are ill, those who are sin sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And that's you and that's me. So we realize our need. And when we turn from ourselves and stop this righteousness, stop this false righteousness, Uh, when we come to the only one who can save us. I tell you, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I, I, I need your salvation. Help, help, help me. Let's take a moment of silence that we can speak to God and ask him to reveal the sins in our hearts. And if we haven't done it, let's turn to him. Let's, let's not mess about 
Send it to Jesus. I desperately need you. Every hour I need you. Let's take a moment of silence just to do business with God. Father, we praise you that your son Jesus came for people like Levi, the tax collectors, the sinners, <coughs> us. Thank you again for your grace and mercy for those who don't deserve it, us. And we praise you again that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins for us. Because at the cross, he won forgiveness for us. Lord, as we take what Emma was telling us this morning, Lord, help us to take the medicine. Help us to see the diagnosis. Help us to run to Dr. Jesus. To see how good you are. Let us, Lord, how good you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I just say, if you have committed your life to Christ, if you have uh, done business with God this morning, you want to talk about it, my door is always open. I'll talk to you after the service, or you can phone me afterwards, we can chat about it. Um, but, but again, don't, don't just let this moment pass you by. Don't, 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 pass by. Don't, don't pretend to be righteous when you're not. We're not. We're not. Hear Jesus' gracious words in, it, in his word. That he's come to call people like me, people like you. We're all sin sick. We need that help. Hear his gracious offer this morning. Can I ask Claire White to come up? lead us in prayer. Let's pray. God, we thank you for another Sunday where we can freely come to learn more about who you are. We thank you for equipping Brian to speak to us and our children's church leaders to speak to the youngest of our congregation as well. We pray that each week you can continue to confront us and challenge us and to amaze us with your grace and your love, no matter where we are in our faith. We thank you for Rick and Alistair and visiting with us today. Um, we thank you that they have been called to work with children and save you. Um, we thank you for Rick's story. Um, we thank you for our own Christian friends who have hope in us and pray for us. We pray that you would use them to speak to young people and teach them about you and your big plan for them and their place in your kingdom. We pray for our own church family. Help us to strengthen each other, encourage each other, and allow us to be open and honest with each other. May we be a church of encouragement, understanding, and accountability. And may we strive to serve you in our community in whatever form that may take. We thank you that you continue to guide us through uncertain times, both through the building work and through the last few months of the passing the baton between Jeff and Brian. We thank you for the Martin family. Thank you that they felt your call to come to Avalon and to guide us when we needed it the most. We pray that they continue to feel welcome. We pray that as relationships continue to grow over the coming months and years, that you would be in it all, leading us to further your kingdom. We pray for our upcoming Christmas Friday night, day, Friday. <laughs> we pray for willing volunteers and an abundance of people to come through our doors. We pray that we continue to see it as an opportunity to display what you have to offer um, and that we could be used as your witnesses in our community in whatever way you see fit. We pray for our world. Lord, we turn on the TV, we look at our phones and we see so much hurt and sadness 
and we know this isn't what you wanted for us and it isn't what you wanted for our world, nor is this the way that you made our world to be. We pray for those who are suffering, help them, hear them as they cry out to you, and stir us into action through prayer, through giving, in whatever way you wish to use us, may we be open to that. We pray also for our mission partners, those working in CEF, the Mercy Ships, Fisherman's Mission, Muller Town, elsewhere. We thank you that your Great Commission comes in so many forms. Equip them, guide them, and help each of us lift them up in prayer. And now, God, we pray for those who are hurt and suffering. We all know in our own lives of people who are unwell, hurting, or bereft. And we lift them up in a moment of silence to you now. We pray that you would comfort them, giving them hope and healing. And we pray that you would be their light in the darkness. We pray for the Purdy family, the Armstrong family, the Russell family, and most recently the Meehan family. Be with them all in the hard days, weeks, months, and years ahead. And allow them to know that we as a Bob Church family are praying for them. We ask all of these things in your son's precious name. Our, our final hymn today is, is Anne Can It Be? And there's, there's a beautiful story behind this that links in to what Brian was saying this morning. On the 17th of May, 1738, Charles Wesley, the author of this hymn, gave his life to Christ. And he took the <coughs> words that we're going to sing here as a celebration of his faith. And just, I know we can sing words. Sometimes we can sing words and we can pass them by. But just listen to this. And it cannot be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood. That's a question. Do you have an interest in the Saviour's blood? Do you have an interest? And, and here's the chorus. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me, for you? Let us stand as we sing our offering hymn, And Can It Be.
as we finish our service, we pray. Father, as we leave this place today, we, may we see that the chains of sin can be released through putting our trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, the forgiver of sins. Draw near to us. Help us all to draw near to you. And let us leave this place knowing sin needs dealt with. And that, you're, and that you love us. And that you want us. Amen.